So far, 2024 has been the year when more and more companies are taking the leap to autofocus. And today's review is of yet another company that is taking that leap, and that is, in this case, the company Seven Artisans. Today, I'm reviewing the Seven Artisans autofocusing 50mm f1.8 lens. And Seven Artisan's first autofocusing lens is actually a fairly ambitious one. Now, on paper, it's just another 50mm f1.8 lens, but really this is far from being your typical nifty 50. As you can tell, it is bigger, it's heavier, it's nicer made, but it's also optically superior to any of the more budget style 50mm f1.8 lenses that I've reviewed in the past. Now, it does have some flaws that we will detail, but if optics are your priority, I don't know that I've used a nicer 50mm f1.8 for this kind of price tag, a price tag of right under 230 US dollars. And in many ways, I think that this lens is competitive optically with a lens like the Sony Zeiss 55mm f1.8, a lens that costs you know, about nearly four times more, three to four times more. And so that makes this a very interesting value proposition if you're willing to tolerate just a little bit larger lens. So is this a lens you, can, you should consider? We're gonna dive right into it right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber, and use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. Now, initially, this lens is coming only in Sony email, which is what I've reviewed here. It is a full frame lens designed for Sony email, but I believe that they do intend to follow up with other mounts in the future. Now, this $228 price tag is considerably cheaper than a lens like, which probably is the most direct com competition, the Viltrox autofocusing 50 millimeter f1.8. That lens comes in at about 375 US dollars. And the older Sony 50 millimeter f1.8, it is a little bit cheaper due to being discounted at the moment, but it is a lens that isn't nearly as nice in terms of the build quality, even the focus system, and of course, it comes to the optical performance. Now, the trade-off is that th this lens is big. It's 72 millimeters in diameter, leaving a 62 millimeter front filter thread. It's 104 millimeters in length, and so that's 2.83 inches by right over four inches in length. And as you can see from this shot, it dwarfs the Samyang AF 45 millimeter F1.8, and it is slimmer, but it is just as long, if not a bit longer, than the Sony 50 millimeter F1.4 G Master lens, which I'm filming on at the moment. The lens also is fairly hefty. It weighs in at 412 grams. That's right under 15 ounces. But a lot of the reason for that is this is actually quite an upscale build. In many ways, though it's not the same shape, but the feel of the lens and the materials and things like the focus ring actually reminds me a lot of the Sony Zeiss Planar 50mm f1.4. So that is to say, it is a very nicely built lens. It's all bl black anodized metal and it has a really nice uh, manual focus ring here that's all in metal, it's rib. The weight is heavier, it's damped fairly heavy, but that means that the experience feels actually quite, it feels a lot like a typical manual focus lens. And so that is a great job of doing manual focus emulation here. It does have a few of the expected features. It's got an AF-MF switch. It has an aperture ring, though it is only de-clicked. There's no option to click de-click. And there are a couple of quirks there. The first of those being that uh, between f1.8 and f2, there is the they have the one-third stop to tense markings throughout the scale, but they have them between f1.8 and f2. And of course, that is only a one-third stop difference. And so it's a little bit deceptive. You can go along those you know little markings that are there there. And the truth of the matter is you're, nothing's going to change until you hit the F2 mark. The other oddity there is that between F16 and then what is the automatic mode, there is also two markings for those one-third stops. And of course, the minimum aperture is F16. So you're not doing anything beyond that point. Now, those are some of the little details that maybe they'll clean up in the future. 
What is nice here, however, is that the Aperture Iris has 11 curved blades. And so not only does it make for a nice circular shape, as you can see looking at the Aperture, but it also does a good job of maintaining circular bokeh highlights as you stop the lens down. And then even nicer, as you stop it down further, it actually inverts to make a surprisingly nice looking sun star for a 50 millimeter lens. Now, like Viltrox, there is a USB-C port on the lens mount, and so I've also already done a firmware update on a pre-release copy. This is a retail copy I'm looking at here. I did a pre-release copy that I've looked at for a while. It needed a firmware update to try to get it up to retail standard, and so I went through the update process, and it's basically identical. If you've ever updated a Viltrox lens, it is identical to that, which is to say very easy. Now, unfortunately, there is no weather sealing here. The lens hood is included, but unlike the rest of the lens, it is plastic and it, it's okay. It feels a little bit cheap compared to the rest of the lens, which is not atypical when you have a all metal lens and then you have a plastic lens hood. Minimum focus distance here is 50 centimeters, which is better than the Viltrox, which is 55 centimeters. It's worse than the Sony 50 millimeter f1.8 that is 45 centimeters. So as a result, its magnification is basically right between those two lenses. I estimated it being at about 0.12 times, which is a little bit on the low side for a 50 millimeter lens. Overall, however, there's a lot going on here. A very nice build, some actual features, giving you the option of doing manual aperture control if you like doing that, the AF-MF switch, which I love having. And so I, I'm fairly impressed with what we've got overall here for that kind of money. Let's talk autofocus. This, they haven't specified what kind of autofocus motor this is, at least that I've seen anywhere over the last couple of months, but I suspect it is the ubiquitous STM focus motor. You can see here that focus speed is about average. These days I expect very good autofocus and autofocus here is, is good. Typical focus changes are pretty quick and you can see that it speeds up a bit when you get outside and uh, focus changes are more instantaneous. You can also see that the tracking of the eye works quite well and it you know keeps tracking on the face when it's not in the appropriate place to get the eye and then we'll go back to grabbing the eye. I found in some low light shooting conditions that autofocus speed does slow down but I was still getting accurate focus locks. Now what I found over the course of my test across two copies of this lens is that I had really good one shot focus accuracy. And so no complaints about that in a variety of situations. If I was shooting a single shot, I got no problem. And that's not just shooting AFS, that's shooting AFC, but only shooting one shot. The reason why I say that is that if you shoot a burst, as you can see here of just a series of shots taken of me without me moving, focus drifts in a burst. And it did that consistently. When I tested it, I tested it half a dozen times and saw the same thing. And so that's obviously not great. I also noted that if there is, obviously we've got an issue with burst anyway. And so if the subject is moving, things, if anything, are worse still. And, and so, or at the very least equal. Bottom line is that if you're shooting multiple shots in a burst, you're not gonna get all of them autofocused. It will cycle away, it'll come back, it'll cycle away, it will come back. And so I would say that we probably still need at least a firmware update or two here to refine that behavior. And also in the, the bigger picture long term, I think that they probably should beef up the, the power of the autofocus motors a bit as well. And that helps it to stay a little bit more stable. You combine that with a little bit better focus algorithms. And I think that we could see improved focus. Certainly, I think that there's room for improvement even on this lens via firmware update. But if they will uh, you know, up the power Power of their focus motors in the future, I think that that will become less of an issue as well. Now on the video side of things, I would say that video AF results were mostly good. You can see here from the focus pool test, the focus changes are smooth and quick in between the initial subjects, but you'll see a little bit of settling at the end. And what I'm actually noticing is that as it micro adjusts, it's typically actually micro adjusting away from what was already an accurately focused result. And so I don't love that aspect. I did see better results when I did my hand focus test where I switched between blocking the lens with my hand and moving to my eye and vice versa. Again, you have more recognizable subjects that the camera's autofocus system is looking for. And as a result, I didn't see the settling the same way. It is more confident in locking and staying on that result. 
Likewise, in, in this clip here, you can see that I intentionally wanted to move, kind of glide along with focus from one subject to another. And you can see that those focus adjustments, they are they're not smooth transitions. They're a little bit abrupt looking. And so obviously that's not ideal for that. So there are some areas where I can tell that this is a first time autofocus effort, but in other ways, it's a fairly refined focus motor. It is very, very quiet. Uh, it can only hear any kind of focus noise if I put my ear right up next to it. And again, for, for actual typical shots, it was confident in locking on the subjects, you know, shooting through uh, obstacles to lock on subjects. It delivered really accurately focused results. And so for my actual typical everyday use, I didn't really have a lot of objections there. And so if you're not looking to shoot something like sports or your shooting style if you shoot in burst this is not the lens for you at least now but hopefully that's something that will be refined in the future so moving on from that let's talk about the image quality now at the end of the episode there will be a detailed breakdown we'll go a deep dive into the optical performance and so if you want the deep details you can jump ahead to that in the timestamp but i'll give you an overview here for those that don't want that long of the video Optical formula is 11 elements in nine groups, but that includes two aspherical, uh, one uh, extra low dispersion element, two high refractive index uh, elements. So, I mean, that that's a total of five out of the 11 elements that are exotic elements. That's a lot of exotic elements for an inexpensive lens. The MTF chart doesn't blow you away at any point, but what stands out to me is how consistent it is from the center to the edge. There's not any kind of significant drop off. It's within 15% from center to edge. I was actually really impressed with real world results. It's Images feel very sharp, even on my 61 megapixel um, A7R Mark V. I saw, when I did my formal test, I saw very little distortion, about a minus 2 to correct. Very little vignette right over a stop. I used plus 35 to correct. So, uh, very good performance there. I saw some minor longitudinal chromatic aberrations, some fringing before and after the plane of focus. It's not extreme or pronounced, but I did notice it when I was looking critically at images. When it comes to lateral chromatic aberrations, on my test chart, I can see very minimal ones there. I didn't really notice it much in real world images, so not bad there. As the MTF charts suggest, when I did my test chart, I saw a consistently good performance across the frame. I compared to something like the Sigma 50mm f2, which is a lens that costs about three times as much, but it is a very strong lens optically, probably the strongest lens that's in or around this particular focal length, obviously just a little bit slower. And the Sigma is sharper in the center of the frame, but this Seven Artisans is about equal at the mid frame and out into the corners, which is pretty impressive for a lens that costs so much less. By f2.8, sharpness across just about all the frame is very good, and the corners, even the corners are excellent by f4. You'll see diffraction starting at about f11 on a high resolution body, and it will definitely increase at the minimum aperture of f16. Where this lens, I think, kind of stood out to me is the combination of sharpness and bokeh. And that I feel like the bokeh is just better looking than most nifty 50s. It feels a little bit more sophisticated, more like an f1.4 lens in a lot of ways. I would say that that is a definite strength for it. And so you can definitely have a very nice blur when you're closer to subjects. But even at the more moderate distances where you might shoot family related things or, you know, your typical shots, the quality of the the fall off of focus is quite good. I actually did because there was a clear sky and I had the lens. I did shoot in the, the night. I saw some minimal coma. Coma wasn't too bad on it, but I did see a little bit of fringing around a bright star point. So not my favorite lens for that. The other thing that is an issue here is the flare resistance. And uh, you will see when, from these various shots that it does exhibit a variety of flare artifacts. Not the worst I've seen, but far, far from the best. And so you have, do have to ex exhibit a little bit of caution if you're shooting into a backlit subject. Surprisingly, I felt like the colors were pretty good out of the lens, and I have no complaints. They seemed accurate um, with nice levels of saturation, however, without feeling garish or, or overdone. So overall, a pretty strong optical performance for a lens costing under 230 US dollars. So in conclusion, the build quality and the optical performance, I would say are those of a more expensive lens. Now the autofocus has its good points, but it obviously could use some improvement in some other areas. 
Bottom line, you probably aren't going to get better image quality from a 50 millimeter f1.8 without spending a lot more money. But the trade-off is that's going to come at the expense of some size and some weight. And so you have to make a decision, you know, are you willing to spend maybe a little bit more for a plastic fantastic like the Samyang AF 45mm f1.8, a lens that I really like optically and it is incredibly small and compact, or do you prefer going for a, a larger lens that co actually costs less surprisingly, but also delivers really, really strong image quality? Choices, choices. That's the, the way of today's market. If you want more information, you can check out the description below where I have my full text review. I've got some buying links there. And of course, now, if you're interested, join me for the deep dive into the optical performance. Okay, we will start by taking a look at vignette and distortion here. You can see looking at the uncorrected result on the left that we have very, very little distortion and minimal vignette. And on the right, you see my manual correction. Now, the values that I have plugged in here, I've done a minus two to correct for just a tiny bit of pincushion distortion. And then I have dialed in a plus 35 to give us even illumination. So that's just a little over a stop. That is a very strong result. Now you can see from this shot that there is a little bit of an issue with longitudinal chromatic aberrations, nothing that is like serious, but you can see a little bit of fringing both before and after the plane of focus. So in real world shots, I didn't find it to be too critical in most situations. You can see here actually that detail and contrast looks good. And yes, you can see the tiniest bit of fringing around some of these high contrast areas, but it's not at all pronounced. And as we go towards the specular highlights. There's maybe the faintest bit of outlining and fringing, but nothing strongly pronounced. And if we step back to a global level, you're not seeing that at all. Likewise, when it comes to lateral chromatic aberrations, it's kind of the same story. Yes, you can see a little bit of fringing here, particularly on this really bold line on either side, kind of more of a blue and yellow fringing rather than a green and red fringing. But overall, it's not strongly pronounced. And of course, this is the easiest type of chromatic aberration to correct for. It's just the one click variety. So here we have the test chart that will take our sharpness and contrast results from this is 200% magnification and the test is done on the 61 megapixel Sony a7R Mark V. So if we zoom into that very high 200% magnification level, we can see that it holds up just fine. The contrast and detail looks very good in the center. Uh, those fine details in different places are nicely rendered. If we move towards the mid frame, also a very impressive looking result. Uh, good detail, good contrast there. And as we scroll down and we work towards the edge. I mean, all of this is holding up really, really well right off to the very corner. That's a very, very even sharpness profile. So for a little bit of perspective, I mentioned previously the more expensive, much more expensive Sigma 50 millimeter F2. And of course, Sigma does really good with sharpness. We can see in the center of the frame that the sharpness results do favor the Sigma, just a little bit more contrast, a little bit more detail. We can see in the mid frame, however, that these are coming in at a more similar than different. I think the Sigma is still probably a, a hair better, but it's not by any kind of significant margin. And looking off into the corner, we can see that the same is true, that they're really, the results maybe slightly favor the Sigma, but really not by much. And if we look in other spots, like over here, I would actually slightly favor what I see from the Seven Artisans lens up in this zone here. Again, I would say that if anything, I like the Seven Artisans and up into this corner, corner, the same is true. And so really a pretty strong performance from such an inexpensive lens. So the sharpness I saw in a lot of real world shots it ended up kind of exceeding my expectations. And so you can see in this shot of Nala, for, for example, great detail in her fur. Another shot here where it's got good window lighting and you can see that the detail all throughout looks really, really consistently fantastic. Here at a little bit further a distance, you can see that contrast and detail on the subject, you know, the plane of focus is pretty narrow, but you can see that it holds up really nicely. And then even if we move out towards not quite infinity, but close to it, a distant subject, you can see that it's handling that just fine as well. And very, very nice detail uh, here in this. And of course, in this instance, we have a a bigger plane of focus and so as a byproduct you can see that that detail is holding right off to the end and this is at f1.8 
Now, if we compare F1.8 to F2, we don't really see a significant improvement here. The results look maybe so slightly better when it comes to contrast, but frankly, more similar than different. And uh, even down into the corner, the results are largely the same. Now from F2 to F2.8, I do see a bit of a boost in contrast, a little bit more detail there. The mid-frame, likewise, you can see a, an improvement there moving off to this other side. It's looking really, really strong. And then up into the corner, we can see there's definitely an uptick in the contrast and the detail there. And from F2.8 to F4, we can see those corners looking better still. They're really fantastic at this point. And so this is really good sharpness all across the frame now. We'll see those same levels of sharpness continuing at F5.6 and F8. We'll find that diffraction starts to soften the image a bit at F11. And then by F16, which is the minimum aperture, it's not bad, as you can see. But definitely it is not as sharp or contrasty as what we saw at larger apertures. Now, while the magnification level is not high, as we've already seen, the good news is, is that we have a flat plane of focus and up close detail looks really quite good. And so no complaints about that. Now, looking a bit at the specular bokeh highlights, you can see some definite cat eye shape towards the edges of the frame. I will also note there is a there is definitely some of that kind of concentric circles in these specular highlights. Uh, not so much that it really shows up a lot at this level, although I can see it, but it is certainly present. We can see as we start to stop the lens down here at f2.8, you can still see that r busyness in the center of the frame, but you can see that we're getting more towards a circular shape, and it's not, however, until about f4 that we really see that consistently all across the frame. Now, where there aren't specular highlights, I find that, particularly with kind of bright lights associated, I find that the bokeh is actually fairly creamy, as you can see in this shot. Likewise here, this is a fairly busy background. You know, obviously the subject matter here, there's lots of hard edges, nothing to soften it. But you can see in the branches and then the, the cones that are there, you can see that it's rendered really quite well. And then in a shot like this, uh, I'm very impressed with the combination of sharpness that you can see here. Everything looks great. And then the background is nicely blurred out. And this shot is one of my favorites I took during my review time because it shows that, again, that great combination, good detail on all of this, and then a beautifully blur blurred out background. Now, as noted, flare resistance is a bit of a weakness here. And so we can see at mid apertures, definitely a ghosting pattern stopping on down. The sunburst effect looks good, but definitely some ghosting artifacts. And you can see here as you pan across first wide open that uh, there's some various flare artifacts that do take place. And then as, as it stopped down, you can see that those kind of ghosting patterns intensify somewhat. And so I like it less actually stop down than I do wide open. So finally, a look at the coma performance, as mentioned previously. Now, this lens being a little bit longer, mag magnifies some of the celestial bodies a little bit more. So in the center of the frame, you know, the biggest problem is that there is this that kind of haloing, slight fringing effect around some of those bright areas. You can see that coma is not bad. It actually stays pretty consistent towards the edge. But unfortunately, that kind of haloing effect does diminish it. Stopping down a little bit, here's that f2.5, that does improve things a little bit less of the halo a little bit less of the fringing and of course again coma is not bad and so it is useful it's just you might want to try to correct a little bit of the fringing if that bothers you overall however this is a pretty beautiful optical performance in many ways from such an inexpensive lens so you've made it to the end thanks for faithfully watching as always have a great day and let the light in